This conference will now be recorded. Good evening. Welcome at Café Weltschmerz. Tonight we have a very special guest, Ray McGovern, a former CIA analyst for three U.S. Uh, presidents. And Ray is going to help us tonight make sense of what happened in the Ukraine in the last couple of weeks. So with that, Ray, I would like to welcome you. Thank you, Elsa. And before I jump into my questions about the Ukraine, I wanted to ask you another question. Because in preparation of this interview, I noticed that on some interviews that you grow your beard. And first I thought, is this because you are retired? Uh, but then I also heard you explain the reason, and I thought it was both uh, touching and sad. But do you want to share the reason for growing your beard with our audience? Well, thank you, Elsa. Uh, I uh, have to admit that it's a little embarrassing to all to look as disheveled as I do, but there's a reason for it. Uh, I have a friend, his name is Julian Assange, and almost exactly two years ago, he was forcibly extricated from the Ecuadorian embassy in London and put in prison where he sits to this day, even though the US extradition request has been denied so far. So I decided uh, since Julian is my friend, since I wanted some sign of solidarity with him, uh, that I would look as disheveled as he did uh, when he was forcibly uh, execrated from, from the, the embassy, and also a sign of solidarity when people such as you just did ask me why. I can tell them about Julian because very few people know his whole story. And lastly, uh, I didn't want to forget my good friend. Uh, it happens and it's easily forgotten, especially when the press avoided, avoids this subject like the plague. So thank you for asking. Apologies for my unkempt, uh, my disheveled appearance, but there's a reason behind it. Thanks. Well, that's a beautiful gesture for Julian. And I think it's also good that we, um, yeah, that we have to have this opportunity to be reminded of him. That moment that he was dragged out of the embassy made a very big impression on me personally, because it showed the fragility of the of the rule of law on a lot of different levels um and yeah we see we see julian and belmarsh uh chelsea manning is being persecuted snowden is still uh in russia and war criminals are being invited in national tv shows so i hope that at some point this will be reversed <laughs> um and of course, Julian also tried to warn us about the dangers of an empire that has run amok. And I think that kind of relates to what has happened in Ukraine in the recent weeks. What do you think? Well, I think you put your finger on the main problem currently. Uh, Ukraine is a very, very sore spot for Russia. You may recall uh, that when the Berlin Wall fell and when president george h w bush to his credit told uh, mikhail gorbachev we're not going to dance on the berlin wall we're not going to take advantage of your problems in central europe he meant it and he sent his secretary of state over to moscow uh, just two months later early february 1990 okay and James Baker said, look, this is what we want. We're willing to help you, but we'd like to have a reunited Germany. Now, <laughs> maybe most Dutch people my age would sympathize with my feeling at the time. Oh, no, I don't <laughs> want a reunited Germany. <laughs> and, you know, I, I don't come from a country that lost 26 million people yeah. during World War II. I come of a country that lost maybe 400,000 soldiers. So uh, why was it that Gorbachev and Shevardnadze, his foreign minister, could be persuaded to accept a reunified Germany? Well, 
It's a long story, but what uh, Secretary of State Baker said is, look, how about this? Uh, reunited Germany, and we would promise, we the West, not to move NATO one inch, Baker's word, one inch toward Russia from from East from East Germany right now. So they puzzled through it, slept on it overnight, came back and said, all right, I would take your pledge seriously. No NATO movement beyond Germany. Uh, no nuclear weapons in Germany. Germany under NATO, so you'll be able to control them. Okay, it's a deal. Now, that was 2000. I mean, that was 1990. Uh, fast forward just six years to when Bill Clinton was president, and he said, show me that agreement. And of course, it was not written down. Well, if it's not well, written of course. down, it doesn't exist. Uh, let's incorporate Poland. How about Hungary? Czechoslovakia? Yeah, you check the Soviet. Yeah, let's incorporate them all, and maybe I'll win all the emigre vote in the election in 1996. And so they did. Now, NATO has expanded more than double to what existed at the time of that agreement. In other words, the US violated that agreement. Now, it didn't much, well, Russia could not do anything about it because it was flat on its back from having withstood the plundering of Russia after the Berlin Wall fell and after the Soviet Union fell apart. Uh, the oligarchs uh, helped a lot by the, <laughs> Uh, by the Harvard types that came in and advised them as to how to rejigger their economy, uh, Russia couldn't do anything about it. Now, in 2008, and I'll finish quickly, in 2008, um, there were rumors that NATO, in addition to the, co the countries already incorporated into NATO, the extra ones to the east of East Germany, that Ukraine and Georgia would be next. Now, there's one very helpful thing to the WikiLeaks disclosures, and that is a Moscow cable from our embassy in Moscow uh, by Ambassador William Burns, who, who is now the head of the CIA, mind you. And he said, look, uh, uh, Secretary of State, uh, I was called into the foreign ministry by, by Sergei Lavrov this morning, and he looks at me and he says, Mr. Burns, do you know what NET means? <laughs> <laughs> of course I say, yeah, yeah, I know. He said, well, NET means NET. This is Russia's red line, Lavrov's word, red line. If you try to incorporate Ukraine into NATO, uh, we will have to decide whether we have to intervene. There will probably be a civil war. We don't want that. So NET means NET. Tell your superiors. And to his credit, and to his credit, uh, Bill Burns wrote back to Washington and said, you know, not only did Lavrov take a very strong line with me, but you know, you should realize that Russia has its, Russia has its own strategic interests in mind here too. Like, whoa, Russia is permitted to have its own strategic interests? <laughs> well, Bill Burns thought so. And I hope we still think so because we need a leavening voice in in uh, Washington right now, Bill Burns know which end, knows which end is up. Uh, he's has some experience, unlike the Ivy League types that that brought us Vietnam War and now almost brought us a war in Ukraine. So, yeah, because that brings us almost up to date. Because before we go into the current situation in Ukraine, I think a lot of our viewers perhaps are not we. On the Café Weltschmerz, there have been multiple um, episodes about MH17, but I'm not sure if all realized that there was a coup in Ukraine in 2014. And perhaps it's helpful to elaborate on that a little bit before we go into the current situation. It is, uh, Elsa, and thank you for asking. Um, we have something called the National Endowment for Democracy. And this is a funder organization that funds uh, various nonprofit groups. And uh, when Ukraine came into view, we discovered there were no fewer than 56 such organizations 
under the National Endowment for Democracy in Ukraine. Victoria Nuland, who was Assistant Secretary of State uh, for, for Europe at the time, bragged in December of 2013 that we, the United States, had given five billion, a billion with a B as in boy, five billion to Ukraine to satisfy its aspirations to join the West. So that's the background. What we saw in early 2014 was Victoria Nuland, the same Assistant Secretary of State, giving out cookies on the Maidan, main square in Kiev. And long story short, there was a coup. Now, that coup is appropriately called the most blatant coup in history. Why? <laughs> because it was advertised two and a half weeks in advance on YouTube. <laughs> I hope your your viewers uh, know this, but for those who don't, Victoria Nuland was talking to our ambassador, uh, the U.S. ambassador in Kiev, and she's saying, "Okay, we got this thing all arranged now. Yats, Yats Tinyuk, he's the guy. He's the guy we'll put in as prime minister. The other guys are sort of fascists. So we'll put them in the wings and." Uh, Bill, uh, Joe Biden's going to glue this thing. We'll bring him in the last moment and he'll put his stamp of approval on it. We're all set to go. And what about the, he's, the ambassador said, well, what about the EU? The EU is not going to like this. And Victoria Newland uses the F word with respect to EU. Now, it's English, of course. There's a Dutch expression like it, uh, but it's F, bang, bang, bang the EU. Now, one reason we know that that intercepted conversation was authentic, was not manufactured, was because the next day, Victoria Nuland apologized to the EU saying, oh, I'm really sorry I used that language, the F word about you guys. I didn't really mean to, uh, but she never apologized for orchestrating the coup. So on YouTube, on the 4th of February, the intercepted conversation, I don't know who intercepted it, maybe the Russians, who knows, but it was authentic and it, it showed what, what was being planned and who was planning it and what would happen. Who would be the next prime minister even? So when McGovern read YouTube on the 4th of February, I almost felt sorry for the coup plotters for Yatsenyuk because you know, <laughs> it's, the coup is blown. Everybody knows about it now. <laughs> no chance that Yatsenyuk become prime minister. And guess what? On the 20th <laughs> of February, Yatsenyuk is all, all a couple of days later made prime minister. The U.S. recognizes the coup plotters, even though there are neo-Nazis in amongst them, and recognizes them immediately. And the first thing these guys say is, we're going to ban Russian as an official language in Ukraine, and we're going to join NATO. Now, that was the 22nd of uh, February 2014, uh, two, two and a half weeks after it was on YouTube. What did the Russians do? Well, Putin was in Sochi at the Winter Olympics. And he came back and he held a council of state with his main advisors and he said, uh-oh, they've crossed our red line. What are we going to do? And the military and strategic advisors said, well, we have to make sure that they don't have their eyes on our only warm water, our only ice-free all-year naval base in Sevastopol, in Crimea. And so we better figure out what to do about Crimea first. And then there are, there are people in the eastern part of the Ukraine who are Russian stock, uh, who are really leery of this neo-fascist regime. We may want to help them too. Long story short, uh, Crimea voted in a referendum uh, uh, overwhelmingly to rejoin Russia. And the people in eastern part of Ukraine, in the Donbass, Lugansk, and, and uh, Donetsk, uh, they say, well, incorporate us too. We, we'd really like to be provinces in Russia. And Putin said, no, we're not going to do that. We're not going to do that, uh, but we'll help you. We'll help you defend themselves. Why didn't up they do that? Would that be a risk for... Uh 
would NATO have joined in then? Yeah. I was wondering about that because it would have saved so much suffering. Yeah, the uh, I think the, the main answer is, and it's a good question, uh, the main answer is that it wasn't as necessary. You can't risk losing your main naval base in all of mm -hmm. Russia. Gave you access to the Mediterranean, black, every, everywhere. So that was a strategic necessity. Uh, Eastern Ukraine, a moral necessity. Many of those people are Russian citizens. Uh, many of those people don't want to be placed under a neo-Nazi regime. And when, when Russian leaders say neo-Nazi, bear in mind, 26 million fell in Russia at the hands of the real Nazis. So they don't like this. these sweat stickers on uniforms and the Azov Battalion claiming Aryan supremacy. They don't like that at all. So they thought they could handle the Eastern Ukraine by helping maybe with volunteer soldiers and some provisions of arms. And so I think they have continued doing that uh, slowly and uh, defensively. But now the situation has changed. Uh, Trump, in his wisdom, wisdom in quotes, decided to give lethal offensive military aid to Ukraine, unlike unlike Obama and Biden when they were in office. And here's a little vignette. This subject came up when Obama was in office and Angela Merkel uh, was visiting Washington. They had a, a joint press conference and one of the uh, newspaper people said, now, uh, President Obama, um, are you considering giving lethal offensive military aid to, to Ukraine? And Obama said, well, we're, we have a commission and we're studying. And Angela Merkel could not constrain herself. She shouted out, eine schlechte Idee. <laughs> That's a really bad idea. You know? and Obama went on, so we're going to disguise in the country. And she says again, eine schlechte Idee. Okay. So that was what, during Obama, so six, seven years ago. Why is it no longer eine, a cane? Can you finish the idea yet? I mean, well, now all of a sudden it's a good idea. Give me a break. Those javelin missiles can kill tanks like, like anybody's business. So, so the Russians are appropriately afraid of that because when when these things come into the eastern Ukraine, uh, Russia is not about to tolerate the butchering of people who really owe as much allegiance to Russia as their homeland as they do to Ukraine, especially now under the neo-fascist regime. So thank you for that. So um, in the recent weeks, this, this situation has escalated after Zelensky um, um, signed an order in which he said that it was now Ukrainian policy to retake Crimea. Um, yeah, what happened and why do you think was he acting on his own? Did he have an okay from the US or NATO? Um, where did this come from at this moment? Um, and how dangerous was this? Well, I see uh, the US as the driving force behind NATO. So uh, I think we're talking about the same thing, the US and NATO. Bear in mind that the same Victoria Nuland who was intercepted talking about the coup two and a half weeks before it happened in Ukraine, uh, she is number three at the State Department right now, the Under Secretary for Political Affairs. And uh, now there's some question in my mind as to whether the full Senate has confirmed her, but I think that's uh, pro forma, she will be confirmed. Why? Don't ask me why, it's embarrassing. Here's somebody openly associated with the most blatant coup in American history, and the, the Congress has already, in committee, approved her unanimously by voice vote. So she will be number three. Now, what is she saying? Well, what was she saying a month ago? That's better stated. A month ago, at the end of March, uh, to these Ukrainian fascists. Well, she was saying, huh? Give the Russians a bloody nose. Now you have some lethal equipment. I don't care what Angela Merkel says. F the EU, okay? We're going to teach those Russians a lesson. And Zelensky says, oh, wow. <laughs> now, Zelensky is a comedian, right? But this is a funny. 
this isn't funny at all, okay? So he says, well, okay, looks like the U.S. has our back here. They'll back us, so oh, I'll issue a decree. And he does at the end of March. And we're going to take back Ukraine. And we're going to move uh, on those rebels, those pro-Russian separatist rebels, rebels in the eastern Ukraine. Now, first of all, labels are important. Do those people desiring a reasonable degree of autonomy in eastern Ukraine, uh, are they necessarily rebels? I don't think so. The rebels were the ones that took over in the coup, okay? These are, are people that more appropriately described as, what, what should we say, nationalists, um, people who have a degree, uh, have a wish for a degree of autonomy. So they shouldn't be blackened by being pro-Russian. Are they pro-Russian? Yeah, they are, because Russia is protecting them. So what happened was, as Zelensky said, we're going to move, and that was a virtual declaration of war on the Russians. What do the Russians do? They immediately started sending troops. Why? Because the Ukrainians were sending troops down to down to Crimea and toward their border with Russia. Now, what really what happened next was really interesting. It all seemed to come together on the 13th of April. What happened first? The head of NATO, the Secretary General, said, "We have never seen a such massing of of Russian troops." on the Ukrainian border. It's unprecedented. Same day, Sergei Shogu, the Russian defense minister, said, yeah, you're right about that. Would you believe two full armies and three full airborne formations? That's what we got going here. <laughs> Next thing you have the, the NATO people say, oh my God, oh, this is awful. All these, all these people coming down here, there must be 150,000 of them sort of a, a concrete ed education about how much these political people exaggerate. Well, before he's finished speaking, he said, well, no, not, not 150,000, maybe 100,000. And we don't really know how many. It was probably at 80,000, maybe 100,000. So that happened on the 13th. Now, what else happened on the 13th? This is really interesting. And I made a note about this because the deputy foreign minister Ryabkov, Sergei Ryabkov, uh, is not given to issuing these kinds of warnings. The background is simply this, that the U.S. had already told Turkey, whose permission it needs to get through the Dardanelles and the Bosporus into the Black Sea, we're going to sail two guided missile destroyers into the Black Sea on the 14th and the 15th of April, so a day or two later. So here's what Here's what uh, Deputy Foreign Minister, first Deputy Foreign Minister, uh, Sergei Ryabkov says. The U.S. planning to send these two guided missile destroyers tomorrow and the next day is openly provocative. American ships have no business near our shores. The Americans are playing on our nerves. The U.S. should realize the risks of various incidents is very high. We warned the U.S. to stay away from Crimea and the eastern Ukraine. Whoa. Later that day, President Biden calls up President Putin. Now, my own view, and I've had some experience with this, like a decade, five decades of experience, what probably happened is Putin called Biden first and said, Mr. President, um, you're playing with fire here. Now, please give me a call so that nothing really bad happens. That's what I think initiated this conversation. So Biden calls and he says all the normal things about Russia, you bad, 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 bad. But hey, let's get together. Let's, let's by the way, let's have a summit and we'll talk, talk over all these issues. <laughs> well, shortly thereafter, Shoigu, the de defense minister of Russia, says, well, okay. We're finished now. Uh, we're finished our exercises. We're going to withdraw our troops. And coincident with that, Putin gets up and says, "Look, you know, we don't want any. We don't want to burn any bridges with the West. But you know, there are people that do want to burn bridges, and they should know that they need to take our red lines 
very seriously lest something really bad happens. Now, we will define our red lines according to each situation that we face, says Putin. And just realize that you're playing with fire and if you provoke the kind of incident we think you're trying to provoke, you will regret it like you've never regretted anything else in the past. His words. Next day, Shoigu says, we're taking our troops out. And Zelensky is a little quieter for a little while, and the U.S. is a little quieter. Uh, in other words, the crisis subsided, but only because there were very strong words from Moscow, from the deputy foreign minister. The U.S., by the way, canceled the sending of those two warships into the Black Sea. Kot sei dank for that. Somebody had a, a level head, okay? Uh, and um, so you had the, the, the massive show of force. Uh, Shoigu saying our troops succeeded in doing what they were supposed to do. And indeed, it seems that they did. So we're left with a situation where there are a lot of crazies in Kiev, a lot of crazies in Washington. And uh, Putin and the Russians need to be afraid and aware that they could come, come into force again I need to keep reminding uh, Mr. Biden, look, uh, this is our red line. We told Bill Burns that back on the 1st of February, 2008, it's still our red line. No Ukraine and NATO and no more incitement of these Ukrainian neo-fascists. Now, when Russians say neo-Nazis or neo-fascists, that resonates in the Russian mind in a way that it cannot resonate anywhere else except maybe the old Poland. So, um, when I was following this news, I, I was checking newspapers for headlines because I thought this is worse than a Cuban Missile Crisis. Because to me it was so, it was such a comparison and then, then checking the headlines and it wasn't making, there, there were some articles, but it was just not, not given the kind of intent, attention that I think it really deserved. So I wanted to ask you, did you see this as kind of like a Cuban Missile Crisis type of confrontation or am I exaggerating when I say that? Well, I think that uh, it could have become a uh, 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis type of situation. <coughs> Excuse me. But it, it fell short of that, partly because of Russia's very strong reaction. In other words, you can never depend on the Ukrainians to act in a sensible way. I'll give you an example. Shakashvili, <laughs> he was the head of Georgia back in 2008, okay? And when Sergei Lavrov, who had just become foreign minister of Russia at that time, and is still foreign minister, when he warned our ambassador Bill Burns, look, no Ukraine in NATO, he also said, look, no Georgia in NATO either. And yet, two months later, namely on April 3rd, 2008, NATO in its wisdom at a summit in Bucharest said, Ukraine and Georgia will become members of NATO. Now, why do I mention that? Well, Shakashvili, who later became an advisor to the, the Ukrainians, he was, he was uh, prime minister of Georgia, and he said, whoa, Newland says she'll back us? The, the so-called neocon says, go ahead, give Russia a bloody nose. And so the, Russian, the Georgian army went into South Ossetia, killed a bunch of Russians, and suffered a very heavy price for it because the Russians came right through, went up to the gates of, of uh, Tbilisi, the capital of Georgia, and said, look, don't fool around with us anymore. Nyet means nyet. So what I'm saying here is that there are Ukrainians that felt the same way just one month ago that the US would back them if they gave the Russian bear a really, a really tight uh, tweak on the nose. Uh, but finally, under the pressure of diplomacy, Ryabkov, and military, Shoigu, 
uh, they were forced to back off, and instead the president said, "Oh, let's have a let's have a, 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 a let's have a summit." I mean, <laughs> the incongruity with proposing a summit at the same time as this this confrontation was going on showed a lot of things. It showed a discontinuity in what who's running Washington, and also showed that uh, uh, whoever was egging Zelensky on in the Ukraine. Uh, finally had been overridden and said, look, you're not going to get us into a war with Russia over Ukraine. So there you bring up a good topic, because who is in charge in Washington? Because Biden doesn't make a lot of public appearances, and when he does, he doesn't come across as very coherent. Um, so you mentioned that Victoria Nuland is the third in the State Department, but, but what is the what is the team of people who behind Biden, who are very influential at this moment? Well, Elsa, uh, you ask really good questions. Uh, this is the key question. And there is a lot of disarray, as I just reflected in, in my remarks about uh, going forward against the Russians or pulling back. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any concrete appreciation of the real threat from Russia. Now, I'll go out on a limb here and say, as many of my professional and also academic colleagues say, the threat from Russia is grossly overdrawn, grossly exaggerated. Similarly, the threat from China is grossly overestimated. Now, why do I bring in China? I bring in China because Russia has a de facto military alliance with China. It's not on paper, but it's very real. And I've been saying for over a year now that if there's a dust up, if there's a military clash of any kind involving the Russians in Europe, there will be, as night follows the day, uh, clashes. There will be saber rattling in the South China Sea and in the Taiwan Straits. That's how important it is. That's how dangerous it is. Who in their right mind would want to take on the other two nuclear powers at the same time? Well, for that, you have to get into the mind. Uh, and I suggest it, they're not in the right mind, okay? Uh, who's running this uh, this confrontational policy? Well, you have figureheads like Tony Blinken, who's the uh, Secretary of State. You have a young fellow named uh, Sullivan, uh, Jake Sullivan, who's the key national security advisor. Uh, you've got uh, people running other agencies that have never spent one day in a military uniform, who never experienced a day of war who don't know what war looks like, they can sit on their ivy pedestals and pronounce about this or that and have no idea what they're doing. Now, you're much younger than I, but I was working. I was working as a CIA analyst during Vietnam, and I had a lot to learn. Uh, but I learned first and foremost that the people out of these Ivy League universities, Harvard, Yale, and Princeton, and all these people uh, were really kind of uh, shapen and given to believe that they could do anything. And these little barefooted uh, brown people in Vietnam couldn't possibly defeat the United States of America. Okay. Now, that was bad then. It's worse now because you not only have Russia or China separately. In those days, they hated each other. I was the prime analyst on Sino-Soviet relations. I saw them fighting across the border. I saw them claiming each other's territory. I was convinced they would hate each other forever. <laughs> I was wrong, <laughs> okay? Things changed. Now, they're so economically and militarily intertwined that it's no longer a case of being able to play one off against the other. They're, they're united in their opposition to what the U.S. is doing, um, let's say in Crimea or trying to do in Ukraine, and what they're trying to do in the Pacific. 
Now, mm -hmm. to reduce this to its simplest form, I coined uh, I coined an acronym, uh, and I call it Mickey Mad. Now, many of your viewers will be familiar with Mickey Mouse, right? So <laughs> that's the way to remember it, okay? It's not Mickey Mouse. It's much more serious. It's called the Mickey Mat. Now, if you have a pencil, <laughs> you might want to take this down. It's the Military Industrial Congressional Intelligence Media Academia Think Tank Complex. Now, that's, of course, a uh, take off <laughs> on what Eisenhower called the MIC, the Military Industrial Complex. But if you look at that, Military industrial, to, to be sure, congressional. Ike himself, Eisenhower himself, wanted to include congressional. And they said, oh, no, 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 that'd be going too far. It's true, going too far, because the congressional people has as mu have as much stake in arms making and arms sales as anybody else. So, military industrial, congressional, media. Oh, intelligence first, intelligence, and then media. Now, what do I say, media? as if in all caps, because media is the linchpin. You can't do this stuff without the media. And the same corporations that control the media are the ones that profiteer on arms building and arms sales. Even the Pope, I, I don't always agree with the Pope, but on this he was right. When he appeared before Congress, he said, the main problem in this world are the blood-soaked arms dealers. And the senators and representatives all stood up and clapped, and then they looked in their vest pocket to see if the last envelope from Raytheon or Lockheed was still there. You know, it was hypoc. It was giving hypocrisy a bad name. Okay, yay! Well, he's right. Now, if you add the rest of it, media, academia, you see it all the time. The government has incredible influence in academia and think tank. Of course, those are the ones that are funded not only by government, but the Saudis and the UAE and so forth. It's a complex now that's very, very strong and, and it profiteers on wars. So why are they reluctant to leave Afghanistan? Well, the Mickey Mat, okay? Uh -huh. So that danger that Eisenhower warned against was very potent. And in that 1961, when he warned about it, but he said, you know, there's a way that you can combat this. There's a way you can confront it, but only a well-educated citizenry will be able to do that. And that's the point. We do not have a well-educated citizenry because the same people who are profiteering on these wars are the ones that are shaping the news so that, for example, what percentage of Americans have a very, very bad, a bad image of Russia and Putin? Would you believe 77%? Well, you ought to believe that because that's what the latest, latest poll shows. How about China? 79% of Americans think China is a very bad actor and has got to, got to be confronted okay now why do they think that because of real threats well if it's a zero-sum game if china uh, progresses in its economy and military capability that doesn't mean that that ipso facto the u.s is less powerful we have to sort of sort of share things so let me give you one example that i find very poignant i'm a grandfather okay like 10 times uh, when one of my grandsons was in nursery school, so or kindergarten, he was five years old. I went and I helped the teacher that particular day, and I noticed these young, these young kids. They were really being nice to each other, and there were no fights. And you know, I was, I'm not used to this kind of thing with five-year-olds. So I asked the teacher, I said, well, "How come? Why do these people be so nice to each other?" She said, "Mr. McGovern, uh, come in here." I went to the little conference room, okay? And she says, uh, Mr. McGovern, sit down. How many chairs are around this table? I said, four. And she said, how many toys do you see on the table? I said, two. That's it, Mr. McGovern. I said, what do you mean? We teach them that they have to share. 
<laughs> now, at that same time, I became aware of what George Kennan, who used to be my sort of mentor in Russian studies, what he said right after the war, when I say the war, I mean World War II, and what he said was, look, we amount to only one-ninth of the world's population, but we control 50% of the world's natural resources, and so our policy per force needs to be formed in such a way as to maintain this disequilibrium. We need more than our share, and we have to be able to fight for it. Now, that's not, I guess Kenan never went to this nursery school, and neither did these elite people who went to very fancy schools, but they probably had, probably had 10 toys with four chairs that they could play around with and not fight over. I don't know what, but that's really, you know, it was an insight for me. Uh, there's enough for everybody, uh, but you have to share. Yes, that's true. I think it was Dorothy Day, an activist who said a similar thing. She said, God made enough for uh, everyone in the world, but not enough for everyone and war. Yeah. So, yeah, you were, you mentioned um, the how how Americans, uh, how their views on Russia and China, but even though they have negative views, are they ready for it? Like, because the current administration seems to be kind of belligerent, not just towards Russia, but also Iran, also China. Um, and I was thinking, is this because the internal situation is so fragile that they need some external war to distract them again? But also, the wars have worn out America internally so much. Can they rally people behind another war? Are, are even, even the the Americans who are so disinformed about the situation, yeah, can they be, can they be convinced again after, like Iran, Afghanistan, Libya? Well, uh, number one, that's it. Uh, it's very clear that very few Americans know what's going on, and that's because of the media, pure and simple. Very few Americans know where to turn on the internet for sensible analysis, for sensible news. So they don't know. They don't know much about what's going on in these wars. The more so, since there is no draft, since elite wealthy people uh, can escape any service in the armed forces, uh, since there's a poverty draft, which means that most of our soldiers, or at least half last time I checked, come from the inner city or small towns in the U.S., less than 50,000 50, uh, people, where there are no educational opportunities, where jobs are very scarce. So they're forced to get three square meals a day to join the armed services. Now, those people are just as precious as anyone else, in my view. But in the view of the elite people who are running these wars, they really don't matter much because they have no power. And when they come home in caskets, we have big flowery ceremonies and we call them heroes. And we realize that they're not really heroes. They're kind of victims of this war mentality. So very few people have immediate contact with these wars. Only the poor soldiers, and when I say only, well, that's uh, 4,000 plus in uh, Iraq and uh, 2,000 plus in Afghanistan. Well, that's something, uh, a drop in the bucket as far as the U.S. population is concerned. But think about all those Iraqis. Think about all those Afghans. Think about all those Libyans and Somalis that have been uh, demolished at our hand. Think about the millions, the millions of refugees pouring out of Syria and places like that. So people don't learn about this. People are told, in, in compensation for the truth, they're told that Russia, Russia, Russia is responsible for everything. And the worst thing, of course, I'm no fan of President Trump. Uh, I, I would I would make sure that you realize that I think he was the very worst president the United States ever had, okay? But, you know, even like a, 
even like a, a, a broken clock. Yeah, a broken clock is is right uh, two times a day, I think, right? Mm -hmm. Well, Trump was right two times a day, but no one forgive, forgave him for it because, you know, like a broken clock, uh, you can forgive a broken clock. Like, what am I saying? I'm saying that, broke, that Trump said he was spied upon. He was demonstrably spied upon, okay? Trump said that he was eviscerated, that he was emasculated, that he couldn't do his job uh, as president, and that's true also. And the Democrats did that to him. The The proof is obvious. Uh, let me just give you one short example, if I may. I think we may have two more minutes yeah. or more. Uh, the whole so-called Russiagate story started with the charge that the Russians hacked into the Democratic National Committee, stole those emails that were so prejudicial to Hillary Clinton, and gave them to Julian Assange to publish before the election. Now, number one, were those emails authentic? Uh, yes, nobody has challenged their authenticity. Uh, did they show? that Hillary Clinton pretty much stole the nomination from Bernie Sanders? Yes, they showed that. Uh, did that cost Hillary Clinton some votes? I think it probably did. But was it true? Yes, it was true. And so everybody lost sight of that by this very artificial campaign saying, who hacked those emails? It was the Russians. It was the Russians. It was the Russians. Nobody read the emails. Nobody. nobody <laughs> it was the Russians. Okay. Now, what happened in December of 2017? Okay, so less less than a year into Trump's uh, presidency, uh, the head of the cyber firm that looked into the DNC email theft swore under oath that he had no evidence of any exfiltration of the DNC emails by a hack, okay? In other words, they were not by Russia, not by anybody else. They had done the forensics and there was, no, there was no indication, no sign at all that those emails were hacked, okay? Whoa, what does that mean? That's pretty, that's pretty explosive because the whole Russian thing was based on it, okay? Now, when did he say that? He said that, and his name was Sean Henry, if you want to look it up, although Google won't help you on it. S-H-A-W-N, Henry. Uh, he said that on the 5th of December, 2017. Oh, so Mueller was just getting started. Did nobody tell Mueller? Hmm. When was it made public? Well, the head of the House Intelligence Committee, Adam Schiff, kept that secret for two and a half years until May 7th, 2020, last year, when he was forced to release that testimony. And the testimony is verbatim. It's right out there. It's in the House document. It says there was no evidence of any exfiltration, namely hacking, by anybody, Russia or anybody else, okay? Now, that was May 7th, 2020. Here we are, almost May 1st, 2021. Have you read that in the New York Times? No. I don't read the New York Times. <laughs> read it in any, if you read it in any mainstream media, Dutch or... No. or, or no, no. Consortium so, News, I think. Pardon? Consortium News. <laughs> that, that's yeah. good. No, we, we, we did publish it right away. But, you know, here, this gives the lie to the whole narrative on Russiagate, how it started, why we expelled Russian di diplomats, all this stuff that was all phony. It was all false. In other words, on that, like a broken clock, Trump was right. Okay. Now, <laughs> what does that mean? That means that the media, Mickey Matt, remember media is the anchor, mm -hmm. okay? The media can completely submerge, avoid a story, 
and I'm talking about the New York Times and all the derivatives, that's what we have now, for, well, in one week, it'll be a whole year. And not yeah. only that, for two and a half years before that, the House Intelligence Committee was able to keep this out of the news. So what am I saying here? I'm saying here that without some kind of external force, such as what you're doing, Ilsa, uh, these kinds of alternative media things to educate people, uh, people just won't get educated. And if we want to keep a democracy going, uh, it's, it's past time that we just complain and wring our hands and say, oh, isn't that awful? I, I like to invoke at the end of any of my little interviews what I call, um, what I call the Noah principle. Mm -hmm. And we all know the story of Noah, right? Okay. So the Noah principle is this. No more awards for predicting rain. <laughs> awards only for building arcs. Okay. That's our task here. We're pretty smart. We have a lot of technology available to us. Uh, we have to be smart enough to build an arc, to figure out ways to get our citizens vaccinated against false news and kind of open uh, to receiving real news without any prejudice. I have no access to grind. We tell the truth without fear or favor. And people just need to have access to that. And that is the challenge. That's very true. Before we end, can I ask you one more question about uh, the Russia-NATO uh, uh, confrontation? Um, because uh, Putin made, uh, he said that uh, don't cross our red line because we will respond asymmetrically. And uh, the US, of course, has always tried to um, with with um, stopping the ABM treaty, they started building this missile defense. And then a couple of years ago, Putin uh, announced that they have not just strategic parity, but even above that. So when he, he is talking about asymmetrical moves, it, like, is he bluffing when he says that Russia has a stronger military capability or or did they really uh, develop weapons that the U.S. doesn't have? Well, I can tell you my opinion on that. Uh, for this kind of thing, uh, I re would really welcome having access to classified information, but I no longer do. My impression is that uh, Putin waited several years for the U.S. to come to its senses and then said, look, uh, you know, when, when we took... Uh, action in Ukraine and wanted to prevent NATO from taking over Ukraine, we were, and these are Putin's words, we were much as much motivated by preventing the emplacement of these new so-called anti-ballistic missile systems, which really are, are designed to do a first strike against our Russian facilities, we were as much uh, interested in, in preventing that as we were in preventing Ukraine from getting into NATO. Putin uh, did put on uh, accelerated development of these very sophisticated weapons. Now, I haven't heard any U.S. military or industrial people say, ah, oh, he's just bluffing, he doesn't have these things, uh, but that doesn't tell me much of anything. What what I do know is that Putin has test fired one of these missiles from a ship into the northern part of, uh, of Russia. And uh, you know what Mach is, that's the speed of sound. Uh, mm -hmm. We used to brag about a, a plane that could be Mach 1 or Mach 2. These missiles fly, Putin said, at Mach 8. And this one test fire was at Mach 7. Now, uh, intelligence facilities can get the information from these test firings and nobody has told me that ah, he's just making it up so i think that we have to make it take it very seriously in the west that russia has caught up and in some respects actually exceeded our military capability not even to mention china you know, doing something similar and uh, so if we don't take this stuff seriously it's going to be you know too late if we uh, tweak the Russian bear, um, 
the other thing I want to say was that, uh, you know, when I saw that Biden immediately went for the New START treaty, I had some hope that uh, that there would be further development of this kind of atmosphere. And indeed, in his first uh, first uh, announcement of all this, he said there could be talks on other arms control. That really needs to happen. Yeah. The only problem, of course, is what I call the Mickey mat. And when you asked before, Elsie, who's running this country? Uh, in short, it's the Mickey mat. And we've seen that under Obama. We've seen that under Trump. We're seeing that now under Biden, and Biden, you know, I like to think he's got nothing to lose. I mean, he's he's almost as old as I am, for God's sake. You know, he's got one term probably, uh, but even he will have trouble facing into the very powerful influences from Wall Street, from the industrial military and the rest of it, because they're all stacked in favor of making money and appeasing the egos of people who think since they're educated at Harvard, they know what the world is like, and they don't. But it's also an empire in decline, and they're getting a lot of pushback, I think. So from Russia and China. Um, mm -hmm. So, so yeah, So sorry, that's another, but I, this is something I was wondering also. The US doesn't seem to accept that it's currently a multipolar world. So, if the goal is get to get to some multipolar stability, will we be able to get to that situation without a major war? Well, one can only hope that this will be the case. Uh, the thing that gives me most pause is why would any sensible policymaker want to take on Russia and China at the same time? I see more danger in the Taiwan Straits these days I see more danger in the U.S. Navy trying to show its flag in waters very close to China than I do uh, in Ukraine or other parts of Europe. These things are all intertwined. And so, uh, yes, if uh, people like John Kennedy come to, to, to the fore and, and have common sense, we can avoid this kind of thing. But, you know, it, it's possible that smaller countries like the Netherlands could influence this kind of thing. Uh, I would cite two things. Number one, you have nuclear weapons. You have nuclear weapons. Now, there are only 20 of them, but they're but right we there. We store nuclear weapons for the US. We don't, uh, there's no agency. Right. Yeah. But the, in other words, located on the Netherlands soil are nuclear weapons. Okay. Yeah. Now, controlled by the US. but. What good are they doing for the Dutch people? Yeah. Uh, they're serving pretty much as a target for any flare-up in Europe, or God, God forbid, the worldwide flare-up. And why, why is it that whenever the United States says, do this, German and Dutch politicians 75 years after the war, say yes, sir. In other words, one of the main things contributing to bad relations with Russia was the false claim that the Russians or their surrogates in Ukraine downed MH17. MH That's wrong. And the lead investigators now happen to be Dutch. And uh, at the very least, uh, it, it is my view that if the main investigators don't ask former Secretary John Kerry what he meant when he said on the 20th of July, three days after the shootdown, we have imagery, we have tele telemetry, we know when that plane was shot down and where it landed, and uh, we know just about everything about it. Well, why hasn't anybody asked for that? Why has the U.S. been able to hide that? Now, my suggestion, and it's just my speculation, but I don't think uh, John Kerry was telling the truth because okay. I don't see any reason in God's heaven why he wouldn't release that evidence if we had it. In other words, in contrast, 
Do I know what the U.S. capability for collecting intelligence over that kind of hotspot is? Yes, I do. Am I convinced that we have intelligence about who shot that plane down? Yes, I think 95% we do, okay? Well, why don't we release it then? We don't release it because it doesn't say what our Secretary of State charged. And to have the Dutch and others involved in covering this up, you know, that's not gonna help anybody, least of all Dutch citizens. That investigation was very, very corrupted on every step of the way. And there have been very good citizen investigators that have tried to bring information to the front, um, investigated at the location itself, organized conferences. But if you look at what's, what's communicated in the mainstream, it's very similar to what you describe uh, as is happening in the US, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Do you see any hope that we can build some arcs? Well, that's the only thing we can do. I think uh, you quoted Dan Berrigan some time, and I was reading an interview with him recently, and he, he says, the good is worth doing because it's good, and not because you say it's leading somewhere. So I think, especially in this time, you have to recognize where do I stand, and that's what I'm working towards, and that's yeah. it. <laughs> I'm glad he's, he's one of my mentors, of course, and he added that uh, results uh, results are not unimportant, but they are secondary. As you said, the truth is worth pursuing and worth telling because that's the right thing to do. I'll tell you a little vignette here. I saw Dan Berrigan um, a couple of months before he died. I was on my way to Moscow to give Edward Snowden an award, the Sam Adams Award for Integrity and in Intelligence. And so I said to Father Dan, um, I'm going to see Ed Snowden in just two weeks. What would you like me to say to him? Now, Father Berrigan was in, you know, not, he's very, very old. And so he, he, he talked like this. He said, oh, tell him, tell him, tell him he did, he did the right thing. <laughs> okay. So I said, good. Now I was talking with Dan Ellsberg just yesterday. I told him I'm here to see you. You spent a lot of time in jail together. What would you say to Dan Ellsberg? And he looked at me and he says, tell him, tell him he did the right thing too. Now, that may seem a little kind, kind of, I don't know how it seems, but if you reflect on it, you know, that's, that's all we're asked to do. We're asked to do the right thing to tell the truth as we see it and let the results uh, let the results be what God wants them to be uh, let them fly to the to the wind but let's make it make it, make it possible for decent honest interested people to learn the truth and it it uh, makes me very happy Elsa that you're in that business because you clearly have done your homework and you know what you're talking about well, thank you. Thank you very much for this interview, because throughout the years I've listened to a lot of interviews of you and I learned a lot from them. So it's a real honor to be able to speak with you in person today. Well, the honor is all mine. Thank you. Have a very good evening. Thank you. You too. Bye.